and we're live to review this episode that Jeff knows the title of. <laughs> it is Homicide, Life on the Street, Season 7, Episode 17, entitled Zen and the Art of Murder. It was written by Lloyd Rose and directed by Miguel Arteta. I'm not sure either one of those had appeared on an episode credit before. So, um, anyway, originally aired on NBC April 2nd, 1999. And I will read a plot summary and then turn it over to Ben for his thoughts before I give mine. And if anybody does happen to stumble into our uh, hangout, then we'll get their views too. All right, so a spoon is the only trace of evidence left over after Munch and Lewis find a well-respected Buddhist monk bludgeoned to death. Because Bayless has become active in Baltimore's Buddhist community, G orders him to join the investigation. As a result, Bayless replaces Munch, a move that frustrates Lewis, who rightfully points out that Bayless, who knew and respected the victim, tends to lose professional perspective in cases which involve an emotional investment. Bayless and Lewis clash in the investigation, Upon learning that the victim often worked with the homeless, Bayless immediately intuits that a homeless person killed the monk while Meldrick is convinced that the monk was murdered by one of the monks who lived with the victim, since they would have had greater access. Bayless objects that Buddhists are, by their very nature, nonviolent, but Meldrick dismisses this as bias. When a witness claims to have seen a mysterious black man lurking around the house, Meldrick is offended that Bayless chooses to pursue the lead, which Meldrick sees as nothing but some housewife's racist fantasy. This disagreement motivates Bayless and Lewis to split up, each pursuing the investigation according to his theory. While Meldrick continues to interview the victim's fellow monks, searching for a motive, Bayless searches for Larry Moss, a homeless man who fits the eyewitness's description, and encounters him by chance on the street. Bayless pursues Moss into an abandoned building, where Moss reveals his paranoid motivation for killing the monk. The monk had offered him a spoon at a soup kitchen, and Moss interpreted the casual act of kindness as an act of disrespect, since in Moss's words, I can get my own damn spoon. Bayless is forced to kill Moss when Moss starts shooting at him. Although everyone tells Bayless that it was a clean shooting, Bayless is devastated by his actions. He is not comforted by a contrite Lewis's apologies for assumption and statement that Bayless's emotional approach to the job has actually made him a good cop and says he is left without any identity as he is no longer worthy of being a Buddhist. In a parallel investigation, Ballard and Gardy respond to a street shooting witnessed by the victim's mother, sister, and neighbor. The sister identifies the shooter as a local hood named either Jacko or Jocko, but when Ballard and Gardy track Jacko down, the neighbor who witnessed the shooting mistakenly insists that Jacko is not the man who shot Williams. The cops know that Jacko probably did it, but when he gives an alibi for being in another location, they don't have enough evidence to prove he is lying because the timeline for running between the two locations is unclear. In the end, to the horror of the victim's family, Jacko gets away with murder. So, that's what happened. Ben, what would you think? Well, I think whenever there's an open ending and they can't close the case, I'm always like to give an extra point. Just because I like the novelty of that compared to other series where there's less suspense because they always close the case. Yeah, one um, thing I would add to that uh, real quick is that, because it, it didn't specifically mention this, that, that the, at the end of the episode, you actually see... Uh, Jacko throwing the gun away, so they pretty much do come out and tell you, you know, he was definitely the guy, but he's not going to probably pay for it because they don't have enough evidence on. So I'm not sure we've actually seen that specific thing happen in an episode before. We've we've certainly had suspects that were not going to be prosecuted that we were pretty sure probably did it, but we hadn't actually seen one that ended the, that way with somebody very obviously, you know throwing the murder weapon away and kind of almost gloating about the fact they're going to get away with it. Yeah. Um, the other bit I like, there was a good line uh, from one of the monks. We believe in deadbolts, detective. We're spiritual, not stupid. Mm -hmm. I like that. And um, Felder, classic ENFJ cult leader. Uh, glad he died. <laughs> 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 because of all the stuff with adultery and then Lewis mentions something about Bill Clinton and uh, the public apology and again we, we have a little bit of a muddle with the typeline 
uh, with the sorry with the timeline because uh, in our version of the reality they never mentioned Monica Lewinsky and so maybe Bill Clinton must have been apologizing for something apologizing for something else so yes that was just when Lewis was talking about the effectiveness of the public apology because Americans like to give people a second chance and he was saying that then it was the reason why I mentioned that is because the court leader made a show of doing an apology to the man whose wife he slept with and it was almost like an ENFJ trick to like get him more into the court uh, kind of thing so uh, I also liked the sort of like the motive, the way the homeless guy was written in terms of that he just wanted some soup, that he didn't really want to be patronized. So I thought his psychology was convincing and that he was quite well played. What did you think of the guy playing him? Well, you, you're, you're supposed to talk a little bit longer than that. <laughs> oh, I thought I went through enough points. Because, uh, well, because I was uh, because doing I something. Remember the name, the name of the actor uh, who played him, uh, but yeah, I've seen him in other stuff before. Um, most notably on One Life to Live, he was one of the like police chief guys, and he was right. really good on there too. So, um, but I. Um, it may be Terry Alexander, because that's what I'm seeing in the cast. It just lists the name, though, as Homeless Man. Yeah, yeah, okay. So he, he the character he played on One Life to Live was named Troy Nichols. Um, so, yeah, uh, he uh, previously was on Hill Street Blues and uh, has been on Law & Order SVU and, anyway, Who's quite a few who, other things. But Who is Austin Pendleton? Austin Pendleton plays the, the, the new uh, chief medical examiner... Grisham, oh, Grisham, whatever they call him. Right. Probably an NT, that guy. Seems a little bit off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was funny because um, you had the scene in this one where he says something about um, uh, about meditation is the one thing, like, he studied with Buddhism, and so uh, Bayless gets momentarily, like, uh, interested in, like, his meditation, and then then uh, his response about the meditation gets gets too NT for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I don't know, what did you think of the, do you think it's a bit of padding, the all the stuff with uh, Ballard and Falzone? Well, I don't think it's padding. I'm just not particularly interested in it. Ah, okay. I mean... It, it makes sense within the context. We've had this sort of continuing story, but um, as Bradley sort of inadvertently pointed out a couple of weeks ago, I think um, the fact that that storyline is like one of the few recurring things going on in this season shows that this season really hasn't had a whole lot of <laughs> interesting yeah. recurring stories. <laughs> that yeah. that's been, you know, one of the primary things. And of course, I guess Bayless's sort of self discovery that's continued from previous seasons, which. You know, you could definitely say the the positive and negative of this episode for me is that um, we get a, I think, a good sort of uh, development in Bayless, sort of, I guess, the next uh, step on his journey. Uh, the negative was that uh, we started the episode with Munch and then it was sort of like he's written out of the rest of the episode. And yeah. we, so we didn't. We had we had Lewis introducing Munch as being in a bad mood, and and so it's like you're almost looking forward to some good Munch snark, and then we don't really get any. <laughs> Is it a little bit of a th at this point was like Munch starting to become more of a famous character, and it might have been this thing like with Star Trek Voyager working Seven of Nine into the story just a little bit, so that then put her in the trailer. Uh, do you think it was getting like that with Munch? I mean, where... not that I know of. Because, I mean, uh, at the time, nobody knew that he was going to be on, yeah. you know, the, the SVU and become better known from that and stuff. And, you know, so I don't think so. In fact, he'd been quite underused 
in the last couple of seasons or so. So, um, so yeah, the, the, that's the disappointment. The positive was that I think we, this was probably, um, and not that Kyle Seagor has been not good before. He's always been good, but the character, I think he had a better, a better performance in this episode just because they gave him a, a better dialogue, I think, and better stuff to do. Yeah. Like some of what he had been doing in, in recent episodes, especially last week's, just wasn't, I mean, it was kind of depressing, but, you know, there wasn't, in this, it's sort of like, you know, the uh, the flip side of that, where it's like, even though he personally, the end of it seems to be kind of directionless, which he also was in the previous week, yeah. uh, it seems like it, it was sort of like a, uh, the end of a chapter for him, or the beginning, you know, it's like you have this, um, you know, where he's come to this conclusion, and, you know, we could say in, in a somewhat cynical way, we could say he he's realized he's he's a guardian, not an idealist. <laughs> um, also, in the previous episode, he made a little bit of a mistake where he said, well, first of all, he says he's bisexual. And then he says, oh, he's got to be celibate because he can't be gay. So he just won't admit that he's totally gay there because he could still go with women. So that just seems a bit odd. I mean, uh, it doesn't seem any odder than anything else he said. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's like just a little part of him where it's like, where, you know, he still wants to say he's bisexual. I mean, I almost but... interpret it as even though he's not really, you know, that old, he's still like in his 30s, but uh, it's almost sort of like a midlife crisis type of thing. Where yeah. It's like the whole sexuality thing was just sort of a, you know, like he hits this moment of where if I really been, it, you know, he even said it in the one episode that that it was almost like he considered men because he his luck with women had been bad. <clears throat> so it was like not that he really found himself thinking, oh, I'm I'm just really into men. It was just more like he was curious to see what it was like or something. He's like, well, I get along with men as friends, so maybe I, <laughs> you know, what is something else? So it was kind of a right. half hearted in some ways. Yeah. It's like he wanted to sort of be involved in a in, in the scene or sort of exploring things without actually committing to anything. So, which is the the one, you know, cop in last week's episode sort of called him out on that a little bit. Um so, you know, but in this episode it seemed like it it, it was less about uh about that as it was him sort of having a more of an overall uh, realization that um, his interest in Buddhism and stuff was sort of a way of escaping things in his life. Oh, yeah. Really something he was committed to. Yeah, I mean, maybe all this... I mean, because before he went gay, there was all this stuff with him dealing with his uncle molesting him. Mm -hmm. And so maybe... I mean, this is like reading in. There's a point of view where maybe he's like trying to erase that with the I mean how how much is gayness is related to the child abuse from his uncle is a contentious issue um, and I don't know how much that plays into that because when they had that storyline that was a big part of it of Bayless yeah, and... I would have liked to have seen them, you know, if they were going to have these storylines about his sexual uh, exploration or whatever, I would have liked to have had that brought up, at least by him, if not somebody else. I mean, if if Frank was the only one he told on the job, yeah. then maybe another character wouldn't mention it, but maybe he would say it to somebody else, like, you know, if he talked to a counselor or some other person that he would sort of uh you know talk you know and and they don't say because he had the website but but I, but it's it's doubtful considering what else we know of bayless that he would have put anything oh, yeah. on the website about that so oh, there was that bit where when he told frank and then he said he didn't want to work with him anymore mm -hmm. and it took him i think right. he i think he then went back to working with frank but it took a while yeah he did uh but I, as far as i know they never had him say it to anybody else, so it may be that 
as far as anybody else at work knows, they don't know about that. Yeah. So, his, so again, that may have sort of been where him talking about the bisexuality thing was, again, almost sort of a cover because or, or a way to escape something because he doesn't want to talk about the abuse that happened yeah. to him. He'd rather sort of talk about this and the whole Buddhism thing was another thing to sort of be like, you know, I'm this open minded guy who can who has all these interests. And in a way, it sort of keeps people from asking, you know, what's wrong or what, you know, what what things are bothering you in this area because he can kind of uh, put put it on those other things. He's got sort of a way to, you know, if people see him as, oh, he's kind of the wacky uh, mm. Zen guy, then they're not really, you know, it's different than somebody like Bolander started talking like that. Then the people would have like a different impression, you know what I mean? Yeah. So... He he's sort of able to deflect it by giving the impression that he's a little bit weirder than he actually is. Also, Guardians being conventional, at this sort of point, going like that was a little bit conventional. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's kind of my point, is that, and we've talked about this before, is that pe- people of any type can take any action, but the reasons for doing them are different, and the method is different. And so you have... That's why, in essence, it's a little bit more interesting than having an NF character who gets into these things because it's a little bit more expected. Yep. You know, from their personality, it just sort of fits. Whereas you see Bayless doing it, and it seems like someone who's in crisis and and having a problem with uh, his own identity or his own place in the world, like he sort of says in this episode, uh, that he kind of has a hard time saying, who am I? Um... And that's the thing where, again, because idealists have that kind of feeling from a very young age, they've been dealing with that much longer. Whereas sensing types, it's not usually something that we tend to think about most of our lives. And then you get somewhere in that 30s range, you know, the exact age is different for by the person. But somewhere you start to sort of develop those parts of yourself where uh, you question your own motivations more start to actually think about, you know, why am I doing things and where do I fit in, in the world? And so that's kind of what's happened to Bayless. Do you remember that bit? I don't know who that little NF guy was who went around with the camera. Are you talking about uh, Brody? Yes, Brody. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, well, there's a good example. If Brody had said, you know, I'm studying Buddhism or I may, you know, I'm thinking I'm bisexual or no, it, you know, there would have been a few jokes about it probably, but then that would have been it because nobody would have thought it that strange. Oh, because they already thought of him as being sort of this weird guy. So, <laughs> do you remember when they had that storyline about him moving in with all the different people and they weren't happy? And I think Bayliss complained about he didn't want to have conversations about Nietzsche yeah. uh, on the breakfast table. Mm-hmm. So, and also, and also getting into the Buddhism for the reason that he wanted calmness, that he wanted to be at peace with himself. Yeah, and I have this thing about I have this theory about SJ is that, especially at the ICJ and ISFJ, that they organise and a bit OCD about their environment because inside they're a bit they want to feel stable, and a, a disorganised environment can, can sort of like get on their nerves and they need to like calm themselves on the inside. Whereas the SPs are a little bit, they get bored. <laughs> a little bit, you know, they want some external stimulation to like change their inner state. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's because with SPs, it's like our entire lives are phases. Yeah. So it's like we can drop something that we've been really into for months or years and then suddenly switch to something else. And. Guardians especially don't really get that. They're like, what's this, what's going on with this person? Because if they haven't really gotten to know this person yeah. well, then they don't really know that about, yeah. you know. Um, whereas fellow SPs, really, it's not anything unusual. Like when somebody changes what they're into, yeah. like they're, it's just sort of like because we understand or we do the same thing ourselves. So, um, um, Brief, but there's a... There's a... There's a theory in socionics that the SPs are like static types, so it's like they're into one thing at a time, and then it's like they've suddenly changed to something else, and it's like so the static thing is like suddenly one thing, then quickly switch to something else, 
It's not yeah, like I a mean, gradual change. It's not that there can't be more than one interest, but there's usually one primary interest. There's usually yeah. one thing above everything else. And the other things are sort of side interests, but they always take a backseat to sort of the thing that we're number one at the moment. Yes. Um, and what I've actually found, and it's probably, you know, it's different depending on the person and probably different ages. But what I found, at least since I've actually been paying attention to this in my adult life, that it's usually about three years <laughs> where I'm in, I'm into one thing for your, for around three years, and that's usually when uh, it starts to change. Something if you else. if you think of the SP actors, they only wanted to do three years on Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, and, and so yeah, I don't know why that that particular period. I'm sure with probably with some it's less than that, and some it's more. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, and and you could probably you know maybe if you did some research into like the athletes that you know that change teams, you know how often they oh. <laughs> You know, or coaches that do that, you know, I you might see an, a similar thing. I can give you an example of that. I think someone, Davy Thompson was a decathlete uh, in the Olympics for Britain. And I think maybe one coach said to him, only have a coach for a couple of years because within that time, they're going to teach them everything you know. And you might as well move on to another coach who is going to teach you different things. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't like that as a fan, but I understand yeah. it as you know, uh, because I've, I've always actually, it's weird because I have certain things in sports. I'm not sure exactly why that is, but the sports sort of lends itself towards certain traditions being revered, even in, even though it's very dominated by artisans, it's, there's still a very heavy, maybe it's because so many fans are, are yeah. guardians. That yeah. There's just sort of this all, always a more of a tradition placed on it than say like music or something where it's like usually about like, what's the new sound, whereas in sports there's a lot more uh, so, tradition. And so I actually find myself respecting the teams more that stay with the same coach for a longer period of time than are always switching every couple of years. So usually the SJs might be annoyed by spitting, but when it's in baseball it goes, ah, that's tradition. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> there's a lot of things like that where it's, uh, you know, we've talked about before, you know, people that there's sort of a stereotype, at least in the U.S., uh, guardians being like conservative politically, but as we've said, uh, there's plenty of liberal SJs because they come from places where yep. liberalism is the tradition. Yep. Yeah, and now you get like the eco friendly recycler SJs because that's the conventional thought process. Yeah, but there, and you know, in the U.S., especially in like uh, the Northeast and 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 some in the South, you have. Uh, some of this old guard of uh, Democrats that are kind of uh, working class, yeah. sometimes uh, Catholic or, um, you know, or even if they're Protestant, they're from like more traditional mainline Protestant, not like the uh, evangelical. Yeah. Um, and so they're, they're conservative kind of more lifestyle wise and kind of more traditional family, but their politics are old school Democrat. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like, and there was a tradition of that in the past, like the Christian socialism thing. We won't get into that. Um, you know, when you said about the um, uh, the ballad storyline, I'll just put here the Luther Mahoney storyline, it ain't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I did like, though, I, I want to say, um, you know, the case that the Guardian Ballard had in this episode, not just because it was, um, you know, unclosed at the end, but I liked the aspect, and this is, I wouldn't be surprised if David Simon's influence played in on this because he often likes to highlight the things that are kind of the routine police work stuff. And so we had an episode uh, here where we had, you know, they that witnesses tend to uh, not see the same thing or not say yeah. that you know, they, they, they all had a different, a little bit of a different story. You had a witness who wasn't really a witness because she didn't really see anything. She was going off what her daughter told her. So when she saw the lineup, she's, you know, asking them, you know, did I pick the right one? You know, and that's the kind of thing that really happens with cops in these situations where you have, you know, no two people saw it exactly the same way. And they're trying to make a case based on this. So I like those little, uh, yeah. um, you know, as Bradley pointed out, like the procedural stuff that they do um, uh, like that. So I liked all the stuff where they were sort of like leading the witnesses and like giving them little hints. <laughs> <laughs> So I like that stuff. And then, um, oh, yes, the Guardi Cow, I think Morgan once mentioned this, where 
it's just like the experience of Guardian. He sort of does it in that SJ way, where mm. he can get a little bit structured in his thinking. Uh, so I mentioned leading witnesses. Oh yes, that thing there about that's like a misconception about SPs, isn't it? That they can't focus. Whereas, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know who has that. I mean, they can't focus in situations where they're not interested. Yeah. But in situations where the, they are, then they can be f more focused than anybody. Yeah. I mean, David Kersey mentioned this thing about, I mean, and I've looked at it as well, about ADHD. And I'm looking at the not being able to tell the difference between, like, the NPs and the SPs. And the fact that when the SP is stimulated, they are the best at being focused. And Yeah, and, and um, Dario Nardi had that... Uh... You know, presentation where he said that you know where he showed everybody the picture and then covered it up and asked him to to write down whatever they could remember from it, and he said that the uh, that in when he did he did that and then at on that initial thing, the SPs were the best at remembering the details of the picture, but then he had them come back a week later, and then it was the SJs who could remember the most details from the picture because uh, they had like you know better memory over a longer period of time whereas and, the immediate recall the sps were better and you've got a good line about the njs with this situation Jeff. <laughs> well Over to you. yeah he also said that he said like i guess it was the nps i guess you know any types who said that they didn't really remember very many details at either time either right away or later and the njs remembered details but they were wrong yeah and i remember <laughs> when you did it with Salabot. <laughs> And Christy, yeah. and you really asked that, and they were wrong. <laughs> yeah. So they were they were more confident than the NPs were about what it was, but yeah. the, the details they got wrong. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, what you said about Guardy, uh, I, there was one moment where he, um, you know, another, I guess you could say Guardian moments, because he says, uh, because when he's really trying to, to nail the Jocko guy, he's like this, kid uh this is a good family you know he stressed yeah. that it's a good fa and that's another thing you you know you have guardians do that like categorization where it's like a good family versus you know if this had been a drug dealer that got shot yeah. guardy wouldn't have been as insistent on we got to nail this guy you know uh, whereas <laughs> in contrast to like pimbleton when he had when he talked about how every every life has meaning you know he yeah. doesn't see it as being a um you know, because it's a good family, somehow we should pursue this more. But Gardy is very transparent in that way where he's like, you know, I really want to, it's not just, I want to close this case for my own record, although I'm sure he cared about that too, but it was also uh, um, that he's saying, you know, this is a good family, so I want them to not, you know, have this, this killer go free. Uh, I'll just say a bit about, uh, you mentioned there Dario Nardi, he actually calls extroverted sense and immersing in the present context so that you can react naturally because like you're so focused on the moment and even Kersey wrote that that for SP is the time is now mm -hmm. uh. yeah once again uh, good casting I thought for the yeah. best actors that they all were pretty believable in their roles um, and it was almost it was nice to sort of have the red herring thing that sort of you know, yeah. provided the conflict with Lewis and Bayless. So we had the, this woman, you know, talking about the adulterous monk because, you know, immediately we're supposed to think, oh, well, you know, this it's it's going to be a jealous husband or something like that. And, you know, obviously it tended to, oh. it turned out to not be any of those people. Also, it wasn't exactly a clean killing because when he shot the bullet, it was a little bit over Bayless's head, like two or three feet. Well, so, yeah, I like I, that. You know, I think according to you know, and what G said was, you know, it was like, you know, it was an immediate threat to him. Mm. Where he, even though he didn't actually, he he shot by him, but he he believed him that he was about to shoot him if he didn't. Yeah, and uh, it at least proved that, that the gun worked <laughs> and it was loaded. Yeah, and so, so he, right, <laughs> right. So I think we've done the best we can in this review folks i give it about eight out of ten because and it gets an extra point because of the open ending so that that going forward and so that you never know whether they're going to actually close the case 
Uh, the only wrinkle on Murder, She Wrote was that the murderer did it in self-defense. Otherwise, the case was always closed. And, and I'll also give it an eight. Um, and, you know, it may part of it may be that I was in a mood to be more favorable since I really didn't like the episode the previous week very much. Uh, but I might have even given this one a nine if we'd gotten more of Munch, but they sort of teased us with him by talking about, oh, he's in a bad mood, so we're like, you know, we're going to get some good Munch snarkiness, and then he really didn't. He just kind of said a few things and then bowed out, so that was a little bit of a disappointment, and that's about the only thing that kept it from being a nine because I really did like uh, the story, and we had some interesting character development stuff going on with all you know, even the foul zone Ballard thing, it wasn't much to that, but at least it, it uh, was in context and sort of continued their situation and will be quite the last we've seen of that. So, uh, and we'll, I think, uh, and I think the twist was good with the homeless guy and that it gave him a good motivation for killing him because yeah. it was like he was conflicted about being needing help from other people. Yeah, it was another uh, thing that Homicide does really well, which is um, rather than have this, you know, rational explanation, you have a lot of violence that is motivated by either either random things or, or something that just doesn't seem like a rational reason. It's just something that somebody had a strong feeling about it in some way where he felt disrespected over this. Yeah, and, and it was sort of like hinted at you can see when you, I sort of got the feeling, okay, this is like a realistic portrayal of somebody with a mental health issue around that, and it seemed to have the ring of truth about it. Yeah, I agree. It seemed realistic all the way. All right, so we both gave this one an eight, and uh, if Bradley was here, we'll just have to assume he would have given it an eight too. <laughs> yeah, and this hangout <laughs> would have been even the- better. But uh, that's okay. We still got some good stuff. And yep. uh, join us next time for uh, an episode that actually I think the intuitives might enjoy more than I do because it's one that sort of has one of those um, quandaries to it. Some ideas get discussed right. on well, exactly what the definition of self-defense is. That's the title of the next episode, self-defense. And we're going to make this case to Bradley so, so he turns up next time. Oh, and and, and co- co-written, by the way, by not only David Simon, but also Yafit Kodo. So. Oh, and, and I usually like his stories. Yeah, so. Right. So, bye-bye, folks. Bye.